I'm so glad to see so many people here that aren't just people who live on my street. That's kind of funny, but it's also exciting to see people who live on my street. Here's one now. So I'm Lenore Greco, and I'm with Sustainable Deep River. And I would like to take just a moment to explain a little bit of what's going on in Deep River. But at the same time, I want to acknowledge the sustainable, the sustainable people. Am I going through here? I have a big voice. Uh, we have people from Essex. Okay, our and oh, sustainable CT, excellent. And do we have anybody here from Chester? Yes. Sustainable. Yay! Yay! Look at that. And Deep River Sustainable People. Yay! Yay! This is wonderful. So the reason you're here primarily is to talk about recycling. But first, I would like to talk very briefly about the grant that's going to be implemented at the end of January, beginning of February, at the Deep River Transfer Station. It is, oh, I'm supposed to read this. I'm just going to get. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Deep River Town Hall Auditorium. Oh, there it is. The Deep River Town Hall Auditorium was built in 1893. It is a beacon of history where past, present, and future come together. Please note your nearest exit. Upon activation of a fire alarm, immediate evacuation is required. Proceed calmly and assist handicapped people to the exit in the rear of the auditorium. The elevator may not be used as an exit in case of a fire. People on or backstage will exit through the back stairs and continue outside to Main Street. Restrooms are conveniently located on the first floor. Can we change that to inconveniently located? <laughs> um, and down the stairs on the right-hand side of the stage. At this time, we ask that you please turn off your cell phones. Thank you for coming to Deep River Town Hall mm -hmm. Auditorium. Enjoy the event. And this presentation is being recorded uh, thanks to the name of the organization again. John and Marcus. John and Marcus. John and Marcus. <laughs> Thank you. And it's going to be broadcast at 6 o'clock on Sunday. And it'll be posted on the Deep River website. Okay, so it'll be there for your friends and neighbors who were unable to come tonight. We weren't able to Zoom effectively. Some people asked, but this part of the building doesn't Zoom well. So back to the pilot program that's beginning uh, about the beginning of February. Anybody who uses the transfer station is going to be required to use specific bags for household waste and for food scraps. We took on this grant because waste is, is overwhelming and the state of Connecticut has had to shut down uh, one of their big uh, trash to uh, burn sites uh, called Mira, which means that the garbage that we generate has to be shipped out of state. Currently, it is going in state, but there's some of it that's going to, be going to Pennsylvania and Ohio, and this is not hyperbole. Uh, we have to reduce the amount of garbage that we generate. I'm sure everybody can agree to that. Therefore, we're going to learn about what really can be recycled. Once we're beyond that, most of you are somewhat familiar with recycling, you have to assume. But we're going to start asking people to take out the food scraps out of their household garden. Separate out food scraps. Some of you make compost at home. Yep, yep. This is going to be a little different. And I'm not going to talk for a long time about this. It's going to be a little different because it's going to, this process that we're undertaking it's going to take all of your food scraps, meat, bones, dairy, fish, even some napkins and paper towels, because it's going to an anaerobic digester in Southington where the uh, food scraps are going to be converted to energy and compost. 
So it's different than just putting it in your backyard. And there's going to be more education about how that's going to work. And it, it, it'll all be fine, the distribution of bags. I recently read that those people that can't pick up bags were actually going to deliver them to your door. So it's, it, we've got it covered. Um, but because all of this is new, our community is undertaking it, and other communities are as well. We, we are working with a contractor who is guiding us through the process and is doing this all over the country. So, not even going to take any questions on this right now, but I would like at this time to introduce Emma McDonald with the uh, Department of Environmental Protection, and uh, we're going to learn about recycling. So, <laughs> the CCSMM uh, was created by 
DEEPS commissioner in uh, conjunction with Connecticut municipalities. So towns in Connecticut and the commissioner of DEEP are teamed up to create the CCSMM. And the CCSMM created a menu of options. So this menu of options just contains different ways we can reduce our waste, reuse our waste, or just come up with different solutions to lessening the amount of waste that we are sending out of state. So some of the things that we're doing is we're uh, implementing pay as you throw programs um, and EPR programs. So uh, pay as you throw uh, means that you're treating trash like utilities. So you would pay for it as you produce it. So you would pay for it by the weight or by the volume. Um, and that way you're not paying for your neighbor's waste, you're only paying for your own. So if your neighbor produces a lot more waste than you, that means you're paying less for it. Um, EPR, or Extended, Extended Producer Responsibility, um, is a type of product stewardship initiated with legislation. So it is mandated by law. Um, what it does is it requires producers to take responsibility for the items that they produce. So um, basically they have to manage the end of life of that item. So in Connecticut, one of the, um, one of the EPR programs we have is mattresses. Um, and so mattress companies needed to create a program to recycle our mattresses once we were no longer using them. So um, solutions so far. So this is what municipalities have already begun doing in order to reduce our waste. Um, so we have Public Act 2158, which updates Connecticut's bottle bill. So um, Cheryl will be talking about that more later, so very exciting. Um, lots of other towns have done uh, great things, so co-collection, um, Passive variation composting, uh, collecting glass separately from the rest of the recycling stream, um, and we passed an EPR program for gas cylinders last year, which was the first of its kind in the United States. Um, and also, something that your town is doing is you guys have that uh, grant program that Lenore was talking about where um, you're going to be able to compost your waste at your transfer station, which is very exciting. So, um, this is, we all know about reduce, reuse, recycle, the three R's, because um, that was the original version that we were taught when we were little, like I was talking about before. Um, but as I have studied sustainability more and I have learned more about how it works, um, I think that this seven uh, R's approach is more holistic and covers more of the issue. Um, and so the waste hierarchy I showed you earlier was from a management perspective, and this is more from the consumer's perspective. Um, so if I have an item that I need to get rid of, what am I gonna do? I'm gonna follow this list, and I'm gonna start with refusing it. So if I don't need it, I'm just not gonna take it. So if I own metal cutlery already at home and I'm getting takeout, I'm gonna say no thank you to the plastic cutlery that they might try to give me. Um, I'm going to reduce, so uh, if, you know, I'm eating chicken wings, I'm not going to use a fork, maybe I'll just eat it with my hands after I've washed them. Um, just a silly example. Um, I'm going to try to not throw my food waste into garbage, but instead compost it myself, so that's brought, um, and so on and so forth. Whatever item you have in front of you, you can go down the list and say, okay, can I do this with it? All right, now what's the next thing? Can I do that with it? So can I refuse it? No, can I reduce it? No, can I rot it? No, can I reuse it? Maybe, so it's just sort of being creative and trying to um, divert your waste at the highest level possible. So um, in order to do this, we have to form new habits. So um, when I go to restaurants, it is now a habit for me to ask for no straw, or ask for them to not include the cutlery, or ask for them to not give me napkins, stuff like that. Um, and so here are a few examples of different things that you can make habits of. Um, 
and also things that you can do in your community to help other people to make new habits and change their mindset and the way that they're thinking about their waste. So, uh, reducing food waste in particular, um, you can make a list before you go to the grocery store and stick to it. I always make a list when I go to the grocery store. Uh, I have more trouble with sticking to that list because, you know, you see what's on the shelf and it's just marketed so well. But um, if you can stick to that list, that's going to do really well because if you've made a list, then I'm assuming that list includes only things that you actually need, so you're much more likely to eat them instead of wasting them and throwing them away. Um, you can eat your leftovers, rotate them in your refrigerator, um, etc. And then you can purchase items to reduce or recycle. Um, so when I buy my shampoo, I actually don't buy bottled shampoo anymore. I buy bar shampoo. So it's in a, it looks like body soap, like a bar of soap, but it's for my hair. And it actually, my hair is healthier than it's ever been. It's great. Um, so something like that, I'm eliminating a plastic bottle that I would have been throwing away every time that I was done washing my hair with whatever was in that bottle. Instead, I just get this bar of soap, and it's great, I love it. Um, so if you can reduce uh, the waste that's coming from your products, then it's always going to be better than the alternative. Um, and also getting reusable and washable items is great as opposed to use it once and throw it away. Um, so instead of using uh, paper plates when you go to a picnic, you could bring um, just plates that you have in your cabinets. It might be hard because they are breakable, but it's always possible if you're willing to put in the effort. That one's a tough one, so you don't have to, but you know. <laughs> Um, and then we can reuse, share, and repair our items. Um, one of my favorite volunteer activities is going to repair cafes and helping people to repair their items for free. Um, I enjoy hand sewing, so um, one of the items that I repaired at the most recent repair cafe I did was someone's heirloom uh, doll. So they had a doll that needed its head stitched back onto its body, and I got to do that. And so that doll will now see another generation in that family. And it's just, stuff like that is very exciting, and it's really great. Um, so reusing, repairing, um, it, all in, it all extends the life of the products that we use, and sometimes it can have a really profound impact. And so now I will introduce Cheryl Baldwin, who is also from Connecticut. and sort of how we do some planning. So in 2015, we did a waste uh, characterization of all the waste that is generated in Connecticut. It gives us a sense of where we need to tackle some problems or what are some issues that we're having. At the same time, we do a characterization of what's in our recycling stream. What is all the materials that's going through the recycling facility? And this is the data that we have. And so you can see we have a lot of paper, plastic, and metal, and glass. Oh, excuse me, this is the waste stream, not the recycling stream. And so we have a lot of paper, plastic, metal, glass, food waste, organics, C and D, et cetera. And so you can see that food waste is 20%. It's one of the reasons that led us to understand that we should be tackling the food waste issue because there's so much of it. And so it informs us. So I'm here to talk to you about recycling. So I'm gonna start with what is recycling. Now on the top there, you'll see a man with a car. Now you might have curbside collection where somebody is uh, taking your car. Maybe it's a blue box, maybe you bring it to your transfer station. Ultimately, that first, that first part of recycling is us giving it to somebody else to collect it. 
we are at a very important stage of the recycling process, but it's only the beginning. The next is to have materials processed, where they go to a place called a materials recovery facility. We call them MRFs. A materials recovery facility needs to sort through everything. They separate cardboard from other types of paper. They separate different kinds of plastic from each other. They separate metals, so you'll have the aluminum and the steel. And then they have to prepare them in a certain way. And at this point, what they're doing is they have to meet a specification. They have to bail it up or package it in a way where they can sell it. Because it's a commodity. It's now gone from our trash to recycling to a resource that is going to be sold. So it's now a commodity, which is then sold. And in this case, it's sold to a company that makes little plastic pellets. That's what's in the hands, little plastic pellets. Which then, in turn, is made into something else, a milk jug, which then, in turn, is sold somewhere else where they fill it with something, in this case, milk. And then we buy it. And that is what is recycling. It's the collection, processing, sorting, bailing, selling, making the new product, and then we buy it again. So the question is, is also, how do we recycle? Well, we recycle in a lot of different ways because we purchase things in different ways and we dispose of things in different ways. So we have a trash bag. You might have a cart or a box for your recycling. And then you have materials that go to the brush pile. And then you have perhaps your textile collection at the transfer station. And then you might have your electronics recycling. And then you have plastic film maybe at the local store or maybe a local retailer. You have food scraps that maybe you do in your backyard. And if you're living in Deep River, you're lucky to you start a new program next year. And then you have bulky waste. And then you have paint. And then I just put in Oscar because I love Oscar the Grouch. <laughs> so ultimately, Connecticut is moving in a new direction. We used to think of either thing on our curb or at the transfer station as just recycling or trash. But there's so many much more options. And from a curbside perspective, we're really finding that food scraps is going to be more and more part of our universe. <laughs> So here is the picture that I was talking about before, which I couldn't see because my glasses were too close. Is that this is the waste characterization of our recycling system back in 2015. We hope to do another one next year, but at this point, this is the data we're using. The things I want to point out, over 50% of our recyclables is paper. That is the concern when we're, problem, when we're concerned about markets, we're concerned about fiber. And then look at the red part. That's contamination. Contamination means things that you don't want. If, are there any gardeners in the room? What is a weed? It's a misplaced plant. Well, that's the same thing with contamination. It's a misplaced item. It is not meant to be in that system, and it becomes a problem. It's a contaminant. So we have a mixed recycling system, also known as single stream. And it was really uh, brought about by the industry back in about 2010. We might have had dual systems before, right? Bottles and cans and paper, and we started combining it. It was really about inefficiencies. You have less trucks on the road. You're also dealing with less um, workman's comp. However, it does typically lower the value of our materials. It does increase contamination. And then higher contamination has a, a lot of costs associated with it. So this is a very busy slide, and I don't expect you to, to know everything. If you were here early, you heard that there was a quiz. It won't be on this slide. <laughs> but really what I want you to know is that the bar on the left is uncontaminated clean materials. And the bar on the right, which is orange, is contaminated materials. And that is the cost, excuse me, I have it backwards. Boy, I'm really having a problem reading with my glasses on the stage here. So uh, blue is with residuals, meaning it is contaminated, and orange is without residuals, meaning it's uncontaminated. So what you can 
can see is our materials are not worth as much when there's contamination. And impact is really only $9.80 a ton. Now this was for the last quarter. This was the difference between clean and dirty. But according, if we were going to look at the waste characterization of how much materials were processed in Connecticut back in 2015, and time set by $9.87, it's over $23 million. So contamination is a cost. So some of you may have heard about the Chinese national sword policy. It was really big in the New York Times. They said all of your recyclables were being thrown away. Well, that's good for New York, but that's not Connecticut. However, the National Sword did have an uh, impact on our markets in general, because what they did is they tightened. They tightened how much contamination can be sent to them when we're selling our products and our commodities. First, they said, we don't want um, so much contamination, you can only have 5%. Well, do you remember when I showed you the slide how much contamination we had in our recyclables? 18.2. So they did have to process it, and they were selling it as bales, but they didn't want any more than 5% contamination in a bale. And that was kind of hard to beat. And then it went down from there. They didn't want any of our plastics. They would take our cardboard, but our residential mixed paper could only be like 1% contamination, which was pretty impossible. So of course we started selling to other countries and we started um, benefiting from other countries and a lot of other facilities were being geared up in this country saying, wow, because of the national sword policy, we're gonna have to start processing these materials domestically. And then COVID hit. While COVID was not great for any of us for a lot of reasons, it was great for recycling markets. It, it really was. You remember when we needed toilet paper? Well, all of those facilities that were sort of like taking their time, getting online, they kind of geared up and they came to task. And we started producing more materials domestically and the manufacturing kicked up using recycled content because of it. And so, especially fiber markets were phenomenal during the COVID era. And now the economy is not so great. And with inflation, markets have declined. And so um, these prices are a little dated. Uh, they're actually from November. And it's not, again, part of the quiz. It's more of to help you understand that these materials are valuable. They're commodities. And that with commodities, they go up and they go down, they go up and they go down. And they have been since we have been moving materials, since the rag man was collecting rags from us to make paper. And so, um, Last month, uh, OCC is old corrugated cardboard, and that had gone down quite a bit, and RMP is residential mixed paper, that had also gone down quite a bit. Um, so, unfortunate, but that doesn't mean our materials are not being recycled, it just means we have to pay for it. Plastic containers are the same, natural HDPE, or high density polyethylene, is what we might think of as milk jugs. That actually went up last month in price. Nice. A colored HDPE, think uh, detergent bottles, um, that also went up. Polyethylene, think soda bottles, that went, uh, that went up a little bit. And then polypropylene went down. And so you can never tell where markets are going. And even the folks that give us these updates on a quarterly basis really didn't have any understanding of why some things went up and some things went down right now. And it really has to do with inflation in the economy. It's confusing everything. So this is the big question. Are we doing it wrong? Um, in some ways, I feel like I'm a recycling counselor. Everybody always has so much guilt. And they say, am I doing it wrong? Well, the answer is sort of yes and no. And I'll tell you why. I got another busy slide for you. So this was actually created by the USDA, the Economic Research Service. And the reason I like this slide is that it tells us about the number of consumer products that are introduced every year on our retail shelves. That's 15 to 20,000 new products on our retail shelves every year. Do you think those companies ask me about what packaging would be beneficial for our recycling system? 
Do you think they have conversations with our MRFs, whether it be Connecticut or New England, about whether our facilities can manage and handle that material? The answer is no. So there's a real disconnect between packaging manufacturers and our ability to manage materials. So when people have questions, including recycling coordinators ask me questions, whether something is in or out, I often have to say, could you send me a picture? Because it's a product that perhaps I've never even heard of because there's so many new products on our retail shelves and using new types of packaging that we haven't seen before. Another thing that confuses us is the recycling arrows. If you're of a certain generation, I myself included, really relied on recycling arrows to help us understand is it in or is it out? Is it recyclable? Well, we have to stop using the recycling arrows. So somebody's taking a picture, but you should need to erase it from your mind. You can't use them. And the reason being is that so many things have the arrows and so many things have the potential to be recycled, but that doesn't mean they're acceptable. There's a difference between what is recyclable and what is acceptable. I have an old t-shirt and that might be recyclable, but is it acceptable in this program? No. And so we need to stop looking at the arrows. When we're talking about plastics, think about that everything is a container. Nothing has really changed since the day that we had bottles and cans in one bin and paper in another. It's just that manufacturers have come up with new products and they confuse us. So we only want containers. Tubs, jugs, bottles, jars, berry containers. And did you know, so now I'm a bad state person. So did you know recycling was mandatory? Did you know it was required? So this is your first quiz. So I'm gonna ask you to have a, a show of hands and tell me whether it was legislation uh, passed in 75, 1989, or 2012. So what year did Connecticut have le legislation passed mandating certain materials be recycled? 1975? 1989? Or 2012? Well, it was a trick question. The first piece of legislation was in 1989, and then the second was implemented in 2012. And this is the list, and I apologize because in this light, it really might be hard to read. So this is all the materials that are mandated to be recycled. And everything above the blue line is what goes into your blue bin, blue cart. Maybe you have an orange bin. Do you have a blue cart here? Okay. So you can see it's about beverage containers, plastic containers, corrugated cardboard, boxboard, newspaper, etc. It's about containers and paper. So I thought I'd take a moment just to give you information about the bottle bill because it's changed a lot. Um, so the original bottle bill passed in 78, went into effect in 1980. It was, of course, to reduce litter. In 2009, water bottles were added. And then in 2021, a lot of materials were passed through legislation. So the big thing was it was supposed to all be carbonated beverages, right, when it was first passed in 1980, and then the new thing was water. You can see the five cents after that. Well, in January, we're gonna see all these new materials added to the bottle bill. Hard seltzer, hard cider, plant water, juice, juice drink, tea, coffee, kombucha, plant-infused drink, sports drink, or energy drink. And that's going to be in effect in January. You will notice a transition. If you weren't aware, they had a special session recently. A lot of the retailers were like, what about the inventory on our retail shelves? Do we just throw that away? And the, legislation, uh, the legislator said, no, you can, you can keep selling that without the deposit on it. And then its new inventory comes in and has to have the deposit. So we're gonna see some transition in January. And then in next January, January 1st, 2024, it's gonna go up to 10 cents. Might help. Somebody's shrugging in the back. And then miniature liquor bottles. I think some of you may have heard about these. The miniature liquor bottles were not part of the bottle bill. Um, they have something different. They have a, 
but it's, it's a fee, but there's no deposit. You don't get it back. What happens if you drink these? You get charged an extra five cents, and then it gets tallied every six months by the wine and spirits wholesalers. And then they calculate how many miniature liquor bottles you sold in your town, and then they give the town a check. I live in New Haven, I got a bitch. <laughs> I, I heard from Lenore that uh, you are spending some of your money working on school recycling or school composting, which is a fantastic use of the money. And then we have EPR programs. Uh, Emma mentioned extended produce responsibility. It's really a priority of the coalition at this point. Our uh, municipal city officials and the state officials really see that EPR as a priority. And we currently have a number of programs, including electronics, paint, mattresses, thermostats, and of course, the new law uh, with gas cylinders. And then we have other programs to help us recycle other things in other ways. We have a household, you're, you're lucky you have a permanent household hazardous waste um, program. Uh, your town transfer station might collect textiles, but you also have local charities, and you have food scraps, eyeglasses. I would assume you probably have a Lions Club in the area. Books are often collected. Household items, if you have a um, swap shop, etc. And so Recycle CT is a foundation that's created educational materials, including the display and handouts that you see tonight. They created a program called What's In, What's Out, to help us understand what can go in the bin and what shouldn't go in the bin. It's based on a universal list uh, for all materials in Connecticut, and it uses a Recycle CT Wizard search tool on the web page and also in the form of an app. So if you're not aware, we have one list that all municipalities follow now. It was created back in 2017 in partnership with the department and all the materials recovery facilities in Connecticut. We painstakingly went through every single product and product category we could think about and asked them, is this item detrimental to your employees or staff? And the reason that question was asked is that if you have any, ever seen videos of materials recovery facility, what happens is a truck pulls in and they back up and they unload everything on a floor. Another machine pushes it onto a conveyor belt and it goes up a conveyor belt and then people our friends and neighbors pick through and do the first pick. And then it goes through a conveyor, a, another series of conveyors and blowers and optic scanners and magnets until um, materials are separated. But the first line of defense is people. And so we need to make sure that materials that are coming through are not going to harm the employees. And then we also ask, is this material uh, detrimental or harmful to your equipment? Is it going to shut it down? If anybody knows about manufacturing and business, you don't want to shut your business down. And then, does, is there an item that reduces your commodities? Does it reduce the value of those materials? And that is how we created the list. And again, we want to make sure that we have clean <coughs> materials. The number one contaminant found, plastic bags and bag material. It's the number one contaminant in Connecticut. So, quiz number two. Which bag is the recyclables and which bag is the trash? <laughs> of course, it's, it's a joke. It's the same exact picture. And that's because when materials come in, think about it's got pushed up the conveyor belt, people are picking through. It's not like a casual pick through. That material is flowing by pretty quick. They don't have time to open our bag. So if you have a beautiful, clean recyclables in a bag, you know what's going to happen to it? It's going to be treated like trash because that's what it looks like. And so we have to stop bagging our materials and also not put bags in, in, the, in the materials. Other contaminants that have uh, were top, plastic bags, shredded paper, bag materials, tanglers, things like garden hoses, hangers, even textiles can tangle up the equipment and bottle caps, loose bottle caps. So plastic bags and other films at Connecticut materials recovery facilities are a problem. It's a little hard to see this photo because of the light, but what that is is one of the conveyors. 
It's actually a sort of a series of rotors. It's like um, knives moving, and it pushes the material up because of the little knives. And what happens is it gets tangled with plastic film and plastic bags and other material. And so all that's up there is all plastic bags and plastic film. And do you see this yellow spot? That's a man. Every mid-morning lunch and afternoon break, two men usually have to jump down into the machinery, of course after it's been turned off, and manually cut off all the plastic bags and plastic film. So again, if you're thinking about how to create an efficient business, stopping your machinery three times a day is not the most cost effective, which is why contamination also costs us. This is all the material that was cut off while I was standing there hearing about all the problems with all the plastic film. It took about 15 minutes to gather all of that material. So it tells us we can do better. And this is just a reminder. Do not do this, please. And so again, um, we know the recycling system. It helps us understand why quality matters, right? We understand now why contamination is a problem. And we are at the front end. We are at the front end of putting our materials in our blue box or our cart. If it's cleaner, it's going to be easier to process. It means that they're going to have a better time meeting the specification, which means they're going to be able to sell the material so it's made into a new product so we can buy it. And so, um, just some other myths. Pizza boxes are in. I was at a town recently and they didn't know that. So if you have any questions or if it's causing some marital and spousal issues, <laughs> pizza boxes are in. No loose bottle caps, no coffee pods, no shredded paper, no plastic bags. No expanded polystyrene, which you might know as styrofoam. That's a big no, regardless of what kind of container it is. And sadly, no black plastic containers. They cannot be read by the optic scanners. And some things are just trash. Single-use coffee cups, straws, mildewy, moldy textiles. Use pens and pencils, garden hoses, pot balloons, styrofoam. <coughs> so again, I'm sorry, we should, probably should have tried to turn the lights down. So this, believe it or not, is glass at the MRF after it's been processed. <coughs> so can you see what that looks like? So in that is a toothbrush and tampon applicators, lip balm, toothpaste, pens, batteries, bottle caps, razors, prescription bottles. You probably see a lot of other things too. Corks and yeah, it's a mess. So again, what happens when the MRF processes all the materials, goes through that series of conveyors, magnets, optical scanners, blowers. Glass is the last thing. So glass is the last thing that falls through a grate, and anything that can fit through a two inch by two inch grate is going to fall in with the glass. It's why we only want containers. Just because it's plastic, just because it's metal, just because it has arrows doesn't mean anything. And then um, other things. Think about the safety of the people who pick up our recycling and our, our trash. We have a lot of problems with um, batteries exploding, especially the lithium ion batteries. No syringes. We sadly have a lot of syringes go through. It's a real problem to our recycling um, staffs uh, across the state. Propane tanks hopefully will be less of a problem now that the EPR bill has passed. No ammunition, no lawnmower blades. Believe it or not, they get a lot of blades in the summer. Um, no knives, and I'm not talking <coughs> plastic knives, I'm talking metal forks and knives. Um, no diapers, ew, no tampon applicators, and if possible, keep things dry. So this is the Recycle CT webpage, and in it there's a search tool, and there you can ask questions about a particular item and whether or not it goes in or out. And if it's uh, sort of a generic question, it might bring you back to your recycling coordinator who might have better understanding of what happens perhaps at your transfer station. It's 
also in an app form, so you can download the app if you want, have it right at your fingertips about what goes in and what goes out when you're in Connecticut. And then there's handouts and other materials. Um, you'll find that the handouts and posters are on the table, but if you yourself are somebody who organizes for your town or perhaps your, community, your faith community or your school, all of these materials can be downloaded and printed yourself. So um, they're accessible to everybody. And if you haven't learned anything today, I hope that you've learned that the difference between acceptable and recyclable. A lot of things are recyclable, but that doesn't mean they're acceptable in this program. And you have to think about, is it acceptable in this other program? And now's the quiz. <laughs> are you ready? Slightly different. 
sometimes like raisins, they'll have a, or prunes, they'll have like a, a wet string on the inside, and that's problematic. It's a different kind of paper that we can't detect unless maybe you're a packaging engineer. But um, occasionally you find products that don't have any of that. So this is an oatmeal that has no, it's all paper, except for this plastic rim. And so if you were an Uber person and you want to pull that off, then this is in. If you don't want to deal with that, then throw it in the trash. That's what I say. What about paper towel rolls? Paper towel rolls and um, toilet paper rolls are in because they're just paper. Now would the app tell us about these? Uh, the app will definitely tell you. Mm -hmm. And you have an opportunity to ask a more detailed question if you can't find the answer. And I will actually respond to you. And again, I might say, could you send me a photograph of that? I don't know what that is. Um, but it should have everything in it. And then we also have the opportunity to add new products as they come down the, the pipe so that we can add more materials. This one's an easy one. Does it matter what's, if there's an arrow on it? No, because it's a continuum. You can leave the top on. Yeah, take the foil off, none of the foil. So this is blue, if it's a black top. That's a good question. I would say it's still in as long as it's on the container. Um, this is uh, sort of the new six-pack rings. In or out? Uh, are you sure? It says recycled and recyclable. What color? What color? It's not a container, and it's also black. So oh. good on them for making it with recycled content, which means it has our recyclables inside of it, but it's not accepted in any of the programs. However, any, any beer drinkers here? Oh. Our local breweries, we have a lot of them. Local breweries will actually usually take these back. They have a separate program. <coughs> wow, look at that. So it's accepted, but somewhere else. Oh, here's a nice spiral now. So she's asking a question about kind of like the old, um, oh, I lost it. Oh. you know, the old um, things and how people littered them and it would cause problems to wildlife. So you don't need to cut these up if they're putting them in the trash because it's going to disposal. Um, if you're a litter bug, there's a bigger problem whether or not you're <laughs> That's that. Okay. Any other questions? Is the problem with black that the machines can't see it? So the question is, is the problem with black plastic that, that the machines can't see it? That's exactly it. Okay. Optical scanners get confused and they don't understand what they're seeing. I have heard that they are doing some research and trying to put like a watermark. At least that's how I think of it. Yeah. So that when the optical scanners see it, they'll go, oh, this is black plastic. And because the object, something is telling them yeah. to think about it differently. But I think it's at the very early stages for that. So who knows, maybe in three to five years, it'll, things will be different. Mm -hmm. um, as far as the 5% deposit, we don't, we, we just recycle our bottles. Is that a problem? We don't care about the recycling back. There are no litter. We put them in the recycling. So she's asking if she doesn't get the, the nickel back from the bottle bill, uh, containers, is that a problem? It is not a problem. You can definitely put it in your recycling bin. It's still completely accepted in the program. Um, the only thing I want you to know is where that nickel goes. Does anybody know the answer to that? So what happens is it goes to the general fund. So if you're very supportive of giving back to the general fund, then good on you. <laughs> if you have a, a program, a lot of transfer stations will actually put uh, nickels aside for boys, youth clubs, schools, etc. You could always do that too. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. uh, it's very educational today. And my wife and I, we've been ardent recyclers for probably since 1989 uh, in Fairfield County before we moved up to Essex. But it's a, it's a little frustrating, like we've been doing it all wrong. <laughs> <laughs> now, 
the spousal issues are happening. You can see. <laughs> no, well, I mean, we've no. all been well, doing it. Well, you know, it's, you're probably doing a lot of things right. Again, the manufacturers of packaging don't make it easy for us. Uh -huh. um, they do make it challenging for us, and it would be nice if there wasn't such a disconnect or maybe some type of EPR program could be done that could sort of help rectify the I, disconnection. I, I, th I think the state is going to should have a little bit more education on what to put in and what, because it's, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's you have to really pay attention. This is, yeah, I hope you consider downloading the app so that um, you can have more questions answered. And again, I'm here for counseling for your couple. <laughs> <laughs> the woman, I'm sorry, the woman, then we'll come back. Um, this is very helpful. I'm one of those dinosaurs who still gets a paper delivery and it comes in a really flimsy paper bag, um, plastic, plastic bag, yeah. which I separate and keep, you know, and dump in the you know, recycling bin in Adam's bottle and uh, plastic you know, recycling. But is there a better way to dispose of them? I don't put them in my trash and then put them in the recycling. So um, she's saying that she is an avid reader of newspaper, which is a fantastic thing. And that the newspapers come in a plastic sleeve or a plastic bag. So there's a couple of things. Um, one, the, there is a plastic film, uh, and it's referred to as wrap, a plastic film or wrap program. It's usually uh, with participating retail stores. So depending on uh, Best Buy, Target, Walmart, Stop and Shop, uh, Price Chopper, etc. But at the same time, because we don't have a lot of those types of bags, if you have a friend that has a dog, yeah. they would love it. <laughs> In fact, the guy behind me was ready to take them from it. It's what we use them for. Do you have a question, sir? Um, I, you know, if they're not supposed to be using them in Connecticut, I think uh, some type of legislation passed and it was related to litter and wildlife. So you see them occasionally, but very, very few. Mostly they've turned to these, some have used paper. Um, they have a lot of different types, but uh, these are definitely not accepted. If it's a paper container, like if you get a six pack or a 12 pack or something, those are definitely not accepted. What about um, picking up the newspapers? Paper label, so the question is, what about labels on soup cans? That is fine. You can leave them on. Just put, just make sure the soup is not in there. How about um, post-its and clean aluminum foil? Post-its and clean aluminum foil. Post-its are fine. And aluminum foil, as long as there's no food. And um, I can tell you, they don't want you to ball it up in the sense that um, I had a former colleague and they thought they were, they were so proud they got to be like this big ball. But the Merck operators are sort of suspicious when they get big junk like that. So um, it's better just to sort of, I kind of crunch it and make it look like a little pita. So some of the questions, what about squishing milk bottles or water bottles? I don't think not to do that. Yeah, you can squish them, but it's, it is better to leave them whole because the truck will squish them, and then it just you know allows a little bit more protection for if you have any glass in the container in the your your bin. Mm -hmm. How clean do they need to be? So rinsing for most things, and then you have your problem things: peanut butter, tuna fish, and animal pet food cans. And I would just try to soak them and get out as much as you can. Yeah. Cellophane wrapped gift baskets. Cellophane wrapped gift baskets. Well, you don't find cellophane too much. Do you mean cellophane or do you mean like a gift basket? Yes, frankly cellophane when people are doing gift baskets or Oh, oh, I understand. So it's that clear, that clear stuff that goes around the whole basket with a bow. Um, I think you should reuse it. That's what I think. But um, if it can't be reused, then I would put it in the trash. 
That is not a form of wrap. Plastic film or wrap, like what we were talking about with the newspaper bags, it's a stretchy film. In fact, you can tell the difference, it stretches. This isn't stretchy. And so that it's not a wrap, so it should probably just go in the trash, unless you can come up with a really great reuse or, um, you know, do something fun and creative with it. So the third plastic vegetable bags, yeah, those would be out unless they were stretchy. So, great example would be like grapes coming, that kind of thing. That is trash. That is not a part of the plastic film program. Now, yeah, and um, I don't have it off the top of my head, but there's a new web page that talks about plastic film. You can find it through the Recycle CT Wizard on the website or the app, and it will tell you. Um, uh, it has a whole separate page just talking about what's accepted in the plastic film program. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Dry cereal bags. That's a great question. So some are in and some are out. And now we're talking about the, the wrap program or the plastic film recycling program, not what goes in your blue bin. But um, you will find that a lot of cereal bags are stretchy. And so if they're stretchy, they're in the plastic film program. And if they tear and sort of pop when you try to rip them, then they're not. And that's the difference. And if it's too confusing, don't put any cereal bags in the wrap program. Mm -hmm. uh, Deep River has had a transfer station for about 20 years now. So we're well experienced with uh, recycling. And initially, we started out with uh, separating our paper glass and plastics for a long time and mm -hmm. all of a sudden about uh, three or four years ago we went went to single screen but according to one of your slides up there single screen has the most possibility for contaminants and I'm wondering why we would have gone to single screen when everybody's perfectly happy separating everything well, I think there were a couple of reasons. Um, so somebody is asking, why did we go to single stream? So it was an industry decision. And when I say industry, I mean people who do the hauling and people who do the processing, meaning the MRFs. Um, I think MRFs felt that they could create technology to sort materials where they had sort of two sides to their facility. They had sorting on the paper side, right, because you're pulling out cardboard and other types of paper. And then they had the container side where they're pulling out glass from plastic and metal. And I think they felt that the technology could really separate everything. And I think they are, they're right in some ways that it really could separate everything. And then at the same time, haulers liked it because at this, um, while people were moving to a single stream system or a mixed recycling system, they started moving on to carts. And by moving to carts meant that there was less workman's comp payments. Because think about somebody driving down eight hours, yeah. five days, a week. It was a lot of issues um, for workman's comp and also injury. And so the haulers thought it would be better to have not have the two vehicles perhaps, as well as for their staff. And so they gradually went into that. A lot of um, them spent a lot of money in creating a system for the technology to be able to do that. The challenge was is that there wasn't a lot of education. And it wasn't just Connecticut. There really wasn't a lot of education when they went to single stream. Somehow the term single stream, everybody just thought everything could go in, which is why I try to call it mixed recycling. It's mixed recycling as opposed to textile recycling, as opposed to electronics recycling. Um, it's our bottles, cans, and paper. But it's not everything. And so what they hadn't anticipated is the amount of other crap that would come through the system, and it made it very difficult for all that new technology to really sort it the way it should be. And so now, in a way, we're having to backpedal and sort of remind ourselves <coughs> the original materials is really what they want, bottles and cans. Does that answer your question a little bit? Yeah. Do you have a follow-up? Yeah. Okay. I, I just thought it was redundant that once you had everybody trying to separate everything out, we actually have to pay for There's been lots of specialized machinery yeah. to do the same thing that we were doing initially. There's a lot of conversation about could you go back? 
could you go back to a dual system? And it would be challenging, especially Connecticut, our infrastructure is now the mixed recycling single stream. So a lot of towns did hold out for a long time, but ultimately your materials are still going to a facility that has it mixed to begin with. And so that's the challenge. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, restaurants, uh, bars, large public events, there's a lot of uh, waste. It's, it's impractical to rent any of the containers. How, is that contributing to your non-recyclable portion? So the question is asking about where does the contamination come from? Does it come from businesses, restaurants, public space recycling, et cetera? Is that your, your yeah, question? Bar, and and bars. It's impractical to rinse containers. So I don't know if it's, you don't really have to rinse a bottle of beer, but you do have to empty it. Mm -hmm. um, and so for restaurants and bars, it's not challenging. They should be doing it. If you're not doing it, it should be. Should be recycling it. Recycling it, don't mix. You don't have, um, again, if, if I just drank a can of soda, it's not really about rinsing that. It's really about making sure it's empty. However, if, if they're serving, you know, sardines from cans, <laughs> okay. maybe. I don't know. What about wine bottles? Wine bottles are in, yeah. but drink it. <laughs> <laughs> Most of your modern garbage trucks are split, and that's the other reason for the single stream. One half being the earth green container, or whatever color you want, and the blue container. Most of them today are automatic in that the arm comes out of the side of the truck and picks up the container and throws it in. So he's making a comment on how a lot of our, our trucks are split body and um, there's an arm that picks up the car. That's not everywhere, but it is in a couple of communities and um, not all the trucks are split body. So if you find that your hauler is mixing your recyclables with your trash, please let the department know because that's not what they should be doing. There are no facilities that can separate recyclables out from trash. Is there a question? They are out. I'm sorry, I, I, I didn't give you that quiz. <laughs> so the question was about prescription bottles. So prescription bottles are small, and that's why. And so one of the quizzes I didn't give you was whether or not miniature liquor bottles are in the row. Out. out. Spice bottle? Out. out. Actually out. A bigger, I don't know, is it called a miniature? Maybe it's a miniature. It's a bigger miniature. <laughs> this is probably out. And then this is a vitamin bottle. This might be in. And I'll show you why in a minute. <laughs> So this is the two inch by two inch grade. And so if you were an Uber recycler and you really want to do this, by all means, I'll tell you. But if it's too much, just throw all small things away in the trash. Better to throw them in the trash than contaminate. So this is the size grade. I mean, it's a very much larger grade, but it's got two inch by two inch squares, and this is where all the glass comes through. And so anything that can fall through this grade contaminates glass. What if I put my small bottle in the mail jar? No. <laughs> I'm done. Yeah. I'm serious. If I could do that, I can solve it or something? No, it'll be problem. No, I can't. That's right. So she's saying that the little, the little bottles are great to reuse for creative projects. They're very sweet. Thank you. All right. So I think I see people leaving. So I don't know if there's any other questions. Lenore, I don't know where you are. I just want people to leave their names so that we can contact you if you've got any questions. There it is. Okay, so the question is, is what do we do with food scraps?
Yeah, so this is a long answer. So um, you were mentioning how in the olden days, when there used to be a little bucket and you used to open it up, and you probably, uh, at that point, food scraps and wet waste is called garbage, and we would feed garbage to pigs. And that's the wet waste. So it's possible that your grandparents um, fed the animals or had a neighbor who had a piggery, perhaps. Now, we also talked about composting. We also talked about anaerobic digestion. So um, I think I saw a lot of hands that people do food scraps composting in their backyard, which is great. And then we have a lot of new programs where, um, depending on where you live, there may be a hauler that will come to your house and pick up your food scraps. Uh, we actually, in New Haven, have a guy that does it on his bike. That's pretty cool. And so there are a lot of different um, approaches to collecting food scraps. We also have a lot of municipalities that are collecting food scraps at the transfer station, which is very exciting. Well, what do we do then? Well, we do it. Okay. So she's wondering exactly what do you even do before that. But I wanted to um, just sort of uh, remind folks about what Lenore said, which is the new pilot programs. The pilot programs are very different. They're called co-collection. Nobody's really doing this anywhere. Connecticut's really sort of testing the waters for this new system, where um, it's a two-bag system, and it's usually combined curbside, though you're going to be collecting at the transfer station thing. So um, some of the curbside programs will mix uh, a bag of their food scraps and a bag of their trash in the same cart, and then it's manually separated. And the food scraps are in a green bag, and the trash is in an orange bag. So you're going to be doing a very similar program, but it's going to be collected at the transfer station. So it sounds like, um, so when those materials are collected, the green bags will go to quantum biopower which is an anaerobic digestion facility that will create energy from your food scraps, as well as a finished product called Digestate, which can be further composted. So you were wondering, what do you do with it until then? Like, how do you collect food scraps in your kitchen? I have to have a whole video on that. You should go to Recycle CT's Facebook page. I literally did a little video on my kitchen, because people are saying, what container? Um, you could use a deli container, a big yogurt container, you could use, um, you could buy a kitchen countertop uh, compost bin. The big thing is think about um, what food scraps are and that they can't go anaerobic and so you want to have some oxygen. So you don't want to just put food scraps and then close the lid and say you're done because it's going to get stinky, it's going to get nasty. So you want a little a holes in them. If you are buying a bin, you should come with holes. And so you collect the food scraps, and then every week, either put it on your curb if you're part of a different program, or bring it to the transfer station. So you can transfer all the stuff from your kitchen into this bigger bag. However, you don't want liners in the bag. So you don't want to, like if you're collecting it in a bag, you have a series of bags in the bag, so to speak. Because quantum is going to have to debag that material, and so you don't want to close bags. Um, some people collect food scraps in beautiful ceramic bowls. Believe it or not, I've seen it. I bet Jan would a nice ceramic bowl. So you have them in the freezer, you can put them in the You can put them in the freezer, so if you have issues with bears, especially putting them in the freezer until the week, until that time, which is good, it also, um, even the fridge will kind of reduce and slow it down. Does that help answer your question? Okay. Can I ask a question? Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. I just to want to clarify my pizza sauce. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So if it's stained with pizza and grease, it's still okay? It's still okay with grease. We just don't want the food and no liners. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Eat the anchovies. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm going to end there. I thank you so much for your time. You've been